Religion, Reason, and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Friday afternoon, doing an early show here with a very, very important guest, Dr. Marcus Plested, who is professor of historical theology at Marquette University, also the author of Orthodox Readings of Aquinas, which is what we're going to be discussing today. But before we dive in, welcome to the show, Dr. Plested. How are you? Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for the invitation. Very happy to be here. I'm doing Honored. quite well. Honored to have you on. Exciting stuff. This is a topic we don't hear enough about, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. So let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, tell us just a little bit about Aquinas first and maybe his perspective on the Greek fathers and the Greek East and his use of the Greek fathers in his writings. Yes, of course. I'm happy to. Um, just by way of background, I might say that I started off my own theological work largely within the Orthodox Christian tradition, and mm -hmm. uh, saw Aquinas presented very often as somebody rather foreign to the Orthodox tradition, to the tradition of the Greek fathers, Byzantine theology, um, and so forth. So when I started looking more closely into you know, what Aquinas actually says about the Greek patristic and indeed Byzantine tradition, what use he makes of the Greek fathers and the councils, and also the degree to which the, the Byzantines in particular um, appropriated him once Aquinas uh, was translated um, into Greek from basically 1354 um, onwards. I realized that uh, this idea of a dichotomy between East and West and Aquinas being quite foreign to the Orthodox tradition needed um, substantial nuancing. And one aspect of that, as, as, as you know from the book, is his uh, very intense use of the Greek fathers. Mm. Now, so it wasn't um, unheard of in the medieval Latin West to uh, comment on the Greek fathers. Indeed, um, you know, the sort of base uh, book for commentary was, of course, Peter Lombard's sentences, extracts mm -hmm. from the fathers, Greek and Latin. Um, so using the fathers, of course, you know, a norm of um, medieval scholastic theology. But I think Aquinas takes it to a new pitch. Um, and particularly in terms of his focus on, on the Greek uh, fathers and even near contemporary uh, Byzantine fathers. Uh, sure, he relies on Florinergia and anthologies to some extent, but he also makes use of whole works. He expresses particular devotion for Chrysostom in particular. So at one point he's said to have preferred uh, some of Chrysostom's commentary on Matthew to the whole city of Paris. He'd rather have Chrysostom than Paris. Not that I think anyone was actually offering him the entire city of Paris at the time, but uh, just to give a sense of his estimation of Chrysostom. And you can see Chrysostom's impact, uh, perhaps especially in the Catena Aurea, the golden chain, this kind of mm -hmm. continuous patristic commentary on the Gospels um, that Thomas uh, put together, the behest of Pope Urban, uh, possibly in the context of reunion discussions that were in the works uh, with the Greeks at the time. So Thomas um, is also distinguished, I think, from his contemporaries, not only the degree to which he uh, immerses himself in the Greek fathers, but also the willingness to commission further translations of Greek patristic works, and even, as I hinted earlier, um, translations of Byzantine works, so particularly Theophylact of Ochrid, in the 11th century Byzantine uh, bishop in Bulgaria, a great commentator on scripture, major source in the Catena Aurea. Um, but it's Thomas who has him translated. And um, it's all very well being interested to him, Greek fathers of the 4th century, but to be interested in a near contemporary like this is quite um, unprecedented, I think, uh, in the Latin West. So there's a sense in, in Thomas of the universality of the patristic tradition which hasn't always been the case in the Latin West, where typically Latin fathers, above all Augustine, have been pretty much synonymous with patristics. So Thomas has a much broader, uh, more universal uh, vision um, of the Greek tradition and you know, took great steps to actually getting that tradition uh, better known um, in the Latin West. I should also underline that he's the first in the Latin West to make use of the actor of the later ecumenical council, so the fifth council of 553 and the sixth council of 680, 681. 
You couple that with his use of St. John of Damascus, which provides a kind of precy of the entire Greek patristic tradition, the apophatic theology of Dionysius the Aeropagite. You get, I think, uh, a, a figure thoroughly shaped uh, mm. by Greek patristic conciliar sources, um, you know, well in excess of any of his Latin contemporaries. <clears throat> yeah, he quotes from Dionysius pretty often, doesn't he? Yes. He, he 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 quotes from Dionysius. He knew Dionysius in in, in Latin translation. Uh, Dionysius has been translated uh, several times uh, by Eriogena, by Bagandio, and others. Um, and I sometimes doubt the degree to which he um, appropriates the radical apophaticism of Dionysius, the kind of utter unknowability of God. Mm -hmm. um, but I still think there's a there's a definite apophatic current in Thomas, which again is uh, distinguishes him from uh, the vast majority of his contemporaries. Yeah. So how, how did he view the Latin and Greek schism? Well, it's 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 noticeable um, that uh, he viewed the Latin Greek schism more benignly than many of his contemporaries. So one instance or sort of example of this is his refusal ever to call the Greeks heretics. Schismatics, mm. yes, but not heretics. Mm. Even someone like Bonaventure was quite happy to call the Greeks heretics as well as schismatics. Um, Thomas, you may know, died on the way to the Reunion Council right. of Lyons, which right. is uh, interesting in itself. Not that I think it would have necessarily changed anything had he been there uh, rather right. than Bonaventure. But um, he's very happy to accommodate a degree of diversity within a unity of faith. And for example, he'll talk about contemporary Greek baptismal practice or practices around confession. You'll note, for example, in, in confession, um, the Greeks will say the servant of God, X, is forgiven their sins. Whereas the Latins say, I, an unworthy priest or whatever, forgive you of your sins. But you think such differences needn't be kind of communion breaking issues. And even in uh, issues like the filioque, he is able to see through um, the superficial level of the dispute and recognize that, well, as he puts it, Greeks and Latins are trying to express the same truth using different words, using different terms. Of course, the filioque is a bit of a special issue in that it's bound up with papal authority, which mm. some thinks is quite non-negotiable. Uh, but in terms of the theological question, he thinks it's certainly capable of solution. And, um, so there's what, what I call a hermeneutic of orthodoxy. I mean, when he looks at the Greeks, the Byzantines, he sees them as fundamentally orthodox, small o, Catholic, small c. For some reason, they don't quite accept uh, the authority of the Pope or the filioque, but their, their whole tradition is, is um, harmonious with the Latin tradition. So he has a very benign, irenic approach, um, like his superior in the um, Dominican um, order, Humbert. Um, he recognizes that we need to get to know one another better. That's the key to overcoming the schism, reading one another's works. That's the key. And he does, as I mentioned earlier, um, take some steps towards getting uh, Greek works, Byzantine works, better known. So yes, an irenic, positive, constructive, hermeneutative orthodoxy. This is how he views the Latin Greek schism. Not unlike someone like Theophylact of Ochrid on the other side. Mm. So <clears throat> you mentioned that he he still saw the Greeks as schismatics. Did he just think that they were utterly devoid of grace, or did he think that okay, well, technically they're in schism, but they still have God's grace in many cases? I mean, what what was his perspective there? Yeah, I mean, he he certainly thinks there's grace in the in the contemporary Greek church. If you look at his discussion of baptism or confession, mm -hmm. as I said, there's no doubt that these are valid sacraments. I'd say, yeah, even if. Um, administered in a slightly different way. So this, the, the, the schism uh, between Latins and Greeks is an unfortunate um, and unnecessary uh, dividing line uh, within the one church, I would say. Fascinating, yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about Gregory Palamas and his perspective of Aquinas, kind of shifting to the East and its perspective on him. Of course, St. Gregory uh, Palamas is very, very important in uh, Eastern Christianity. So what exactly was his perspective and reception uh, of Aquinas? Yes, but I have to say he had no perspective on Aquinas. Uh, Palamas didn't know. Well, 
Right, um, right. He, he died only a couple of years after the first translation. So there's no hint of him knowing anything at all about um, Aquinas. Mm -hmm. I mean, the person he did know was Augustine. And it's interesting to see his um, positive appropriation of Augustine, even in respect of, say, the Holy Spirit as the bond of love between the Father and the Son, which is often taken to be a classic statement of a kind of filioquist um, understanding. So he does use Augustine, he does quote Augustine, and in general, he had a more positive attitude to the Latin patristic tradition than many of the anti palamites who were not so <laughs> well versed in Latin theology and actually tended to be very hostile uh, to the Latins. How, how do you think he would have received them? I know it's kind of speculation, but how, how do you think he would have received them if uh, translations of him had been available? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to speculate too much, but sure. what we can do is talk about how some of his disciples received mm -hmm. uh, Aquinas. And here we're talking about people like, um, well, John Cantacuzene, who, of course, uh, Palamas was um, allied with in the Byzantine Civil yeah. War, Theophanes of Nicaea, Philotheus, Cochinus. Right. And in the Palamites, in the sort of generation, uh, you know, just following um, Palamas's death, we see a, a very positive appropriation of Aquinas, um, mm -hmm. especially in the dispute around Prochorus Chizones, who circa, well, in 1368 was um, condemned for being opposed to the teachings of Palamas and opposing the veneration of Palamas as a saint after Palamas's death. Um, yeah. Prochorus Chizones used Aquinas quite extensively, but by that time, the dispute, the Palamite dispute, distinction between the essence, unknowable energies, knowable of God, um, often tended to revolve around the character of the light of the transfiguration. Mm. Is the light of the transfiguration that shone from Christ on table, is it created or uncreated? Now, of course, that was reducing the question to a fairly, um, well, too simple a level. Yeah. But it's very noticeable that on that question of the character of the light of the transfiguration, Aquinas was no help at all to the anti-Palamites. And in fact, the Palamites, if anything, make more positive use of Aquinas than the anti-Palamites in the discussion about the essence energies uh, distinction and the character um, of the light of Tabor. Well, I want to ask a follow-up question about that, but but before we get into that, let me then maybe ask you about Palamas and his perspective of Augustine, since Aquinas used Augustine so much. Um, maybe tell me a little bit about that. Yes, well, Augustine had been translated um, into Latin, but there's no there's no suggestion that Palamas ever knew any Latin, at least a significant degree of Latin. But uh, yes, Augustine had his De Trinitate had been on the Trinity, had been translated into Latin at the end of the 13th century as part of the reunion negotiations um, I alluded to earlier uh, surrounding the Council of Lyons, 1274 and its immediate reception. In the Christian East and the policy of unionism pursued by Michael VIII Palaiologos, who was the one to recapture Constantinople from the Latins in 1261, he sponsored the translation of Augustine and uh, somehow Palamas got hold of it, probably in the 1340s, as I can tell, and um, liked it, even at its most filioquist. And Palamas had written against the filioque, but in a very subtle uh, way that leaves room for, I mean, these are things we can never be too um, certain about or make too positive a statement about, but sees some room for the sun in the procession of the spirit, not in terms of the, uh, the monarchy of the father or the um, the Father's a source of divinity, but in terms of the eternal movement of the Divine Trinity, there's a role for the Spirit, um, a role for the Son in the procession of the Spirit. But this is where he doesn't seem to mind, um, for example, the um, depiction that Augustine gives in the De Trinitate of the Holy Spirit as the, the, uh, the love that passes between the Father and the, uh, the Father and the Son. And he'll quote Augustine elsewhere too, but not by name, interestingly, mm. a wise man. Mm. And of course, that was perhaps due to sensitivities at the time over making too much use of Latin sources. And some of Palamas's enemies tried to um, paint him as a Latin sympathizer, interestingly mm. enough. You know, it seems like there are some aspects in De Trinitate by Augustine that seem to lend itself to the, the Catholic perspective of the filioque. How did Palamas perceive some of those passages that seem to in indicate? Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Well, Panamas utterly refutes the 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 the, the idea of um, double procession. Let's say mm -hmm. um, refutes the idea that there's any other source of divinity uh, in the Trinity um, apart from the Father. But nonetheless, he doesn't adopt a monopatrist position. In other words, from the Father and only from the Father, and the Son has nothing to do with it. So there is a, a place for the Son in the procession of the Spirit in terms of the eternal divine life. And here I think he's taking mm. a cue from the um, Synod of Lacanae, uh, yeah. the, 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 which rejected uh, the union of lions, mm. um, but nonetheless talk about the eternal shining forth um, of the Spirit uh, through, the, through the Son. And I think this sort of through the Son, eternal shining forth um, tradition uh, is there in Palamas too. I even call it in the book an orthodox filioque, not in respect of origination, but in terms of the eternal divine life. Uh, Palamas, we even talk of the procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Son, not in respect mm. of origination, in terms of the eternal divine life. So it's a very nuanced, constructive, ironic uh, approach to this tricky uh, theological issue. You mentioned there, Palamas, uh, of course, picking up Blackernay's view. Um, what, was there anything prior to uh, Blackernay that um, that he drew from? Maybe some of the Cappadocians when it comes to the eternal manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I think this kind of language of eternal manifestation is uh, go back much further than Blackernay. But the whole, I mean, where where I think there is a, a point in the tradition for this. That this kind of language can be um, associated with. This is the whole through the sun tradition that we see mm, okay. on Damascus um, and Maximus. So Maximus famously in his letter to Marinus, when the Latins say and the sun, they mean the same as us Greeks when we say through the sun. There's probably a bit of an unpacking of this through the sun formula. In other words, I don't think a kind of monopatrist position, such as you might see in St. Photius, adequately yeah. expresses the Greek patristic uh, tradition. I think uh, Palamas, with his um, particular understanding of what I call an orthodox filioque, not in respect of origination, in terms of the eternal divine life, is very much in that through the sun, eternal manifestation uh, tradition. Excellent. Now, uh, kind of going back to what we were briefly talking about there, um, maybe let's, let's go over some of the Byzantine uh, readings of Aquinas. So some of the uh, Palamites that come after Palamas, their perspective on um, Aquinas. Ah, oh, some of the Palamites that come after uh, Palamas. Yes, so I, I mentioned some of the names here, people like John Catechusine mm -hmm. and Theophanes of Nicaea. Um, it uh, will make explicit use um, of Aquinas on general theological matters and also against the theology of someone like Valam, who denied that the life of the Transfiguration was uncreated, equally against someone like Gregory Kindinos, who took a similar position. Uh, Prochorus Cazonis was a bit later, who used Aquinas um, extensively, but not on the character of the light of the Transfiguration. Um, of course, all this is uh, detailed in, in, in the book, but um, it's very interesting that it's the anti-Palamites who um, find Aquinas uh, unhelpful in this dispute, rather than uh, the Palamites who actually make quite positive use of Aquinas. That's not to say the Palamites um, appropriate um, Aquinas uncritically, and yeah, taking the story down to even someone like Gennadius Scalarius in the 15th century, the first patriarch of Constantinople after the fall of the city uh, to the Turks in 1453. Mm. Um, there's a, you know, a long tradition of accepting Aquinas where he's consonant with the orthodox tradition and rejecting him where he's not. So, for example, on the essence energies distinction, he's rejected on the papacy, on um, purgatory for that matter. Um, but nonetheless, there's a, there's a, there's a willingness to recognize his Greek patristic roots, his mastery of Aristotle, um, his uh, use of concilia material and so forth. Mm, mm. Uh, the arguments he gives um, against uh, to be used in conversation with um, Islam, um, that he's a, yeah, a very helpful figure uh, to be received critically mm. and uh, not in toto. But uh, yeah, a tremendously helpful support. And as I say, in this even in this Palamite dispute, although he's 
Aquinas is, of course, not terribly helpful in terms of the essence of energy's distinction per se. In terms of the character of the light of the transfiguration, he was a friend of the Palamites and not of the anti-Palamites. What exactly was Barlem's perspective of Aquinas? Because what we tend to hear today, at least when it comes to uh, you know online apologists, is this idea that <clears throat> Palamas represents the orthodox position, which is anti-Aquinas, and Barlam, of course, represents, allegedly, uh, Aquinas in the Thomist perspective and the Catholic, therefore, perspective. That's kind of the way things are uh, often presented. So maybe tell us a little bit about Barlam's perspective on Aquinas. Yeah, sure. Um, well, that perspective you outlined is uh, totally wrong. I can say that at the outset. Uh, Barlam was... Um, Somebody who came, yes, from southern Italy, but the time when southern Italy was largely Greek speaking. You know, he's very much a, a Greek monk and not an Italian or Latin, uh, let's say, uh, monk. We first hear of him in the 1330s, um, involved in disputes, um, dialogues with um, representatives of Latin theology in Constantinople. Valam is the orthodox spokesperson here. And that's, I think, when he first hears about Aquinas, only bits and pieces supplied by his Dominican interlocutors. Um, but yeah, he thinks Valam, it, he thinks Valam thinks Aquinas is totally wrong, he even calls him demonically inspired, demonically inspired. That's how yeah. Thomist he was. And he thought uh, Aquinas was demonically inspired because he was a rationalist. Uh, you know, he used reason too much. Um, he probed where theologians should not probe. He went where theologians should not go. And um, I mean, Valam's response to this is actually ends up being a kind of theological agnosticism. You know, we really don't know whether the filioque is right or wrong. We just need to sort mm. of start talking about this sort of kind of thing, which of course Palamas was horrified by. But yes, Valam is um, anti Thomist and, and treats uh, Thomas as the archetype of the rationalistic West, let's say, which is exactly the kind of um, you know, false dichotomy that's often uh, assumed to obtain between the Greek East and the Latin West today. And it's very ironic that um, that kind of dichotomy has much more to do with Valam than with Panama. And would it be fair then to say that your book really helps offset that misunderstanding? Well, yes, it's one of the main aims of the book to offset that particular yeah. misunderstanding. So tell me a little bit about Demetrios uh, Kidonis. Who, who exactly was he and how, how does he relate to this discussion? Yes, well, Kidonis, I mean, I mentioned his brother Prochoros, who was an Athenite monk, very interested in um, Aquinas and very opposed to Palamas. But uh, Demetrius, his older brother, was really the um, really quite a player in Byzantine politics. He was mm. uh, effectively prime minister of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, the Mesazon, the sort of intermediary between the emperor and his uh, people and the affairs of state. So he's very much at the highest echelon of society. He comes from the aristocratic family in Thessaloniki, but uh, yeah, very close to the seat of power um, in Constantinople and served three emperors as um, prime minister. And found time somehow uh, to translate Aquinas. But Demetrius Cazonis tells us that he was um, fed up with relying upon interpreters in the kind of diplomatic negotiations he was involved in as prime minister of the Roman Empire. Incidentally, I shouldn't uh, refer to it as the Byzantine Empire. I mean, properly speaking, it was the Roman Empire. Nobody called themselves Byzantine at the time. That's a, a later piece of um, enlightenment propaganda <laughs> against the ongoing Roman Empire. Anyhow, um, to digress too much. So yes, he needed, uh, he wanted to learn Latin. Uh, he found a tutor. The tutor was a Dominican. And Dominicans are quite canny, as you know. And the Dominicans say, well, what about this, this chap? Uh, why don't you try reading uh, Aquinas? And uh, yeah, C Cadonius was uh, amazed, not because this was something foreign or other, but precisely because it was something recognizable. Um, I think he particularly admired Aquinas' uh, use of Aristotle. Hmm. And one may note that in translating Aquinas into Greek, um, Cadonius is able to correct um, uh, Thomas's translations from Aristotle on the basis of the original Greek. And of course, the Romans, aka the Byzantines, had never lost Aristotle. They didn't have to kind of re-import Aristotle via, well, via the Arabs as the, as the West uh, did. They had a kind of continuous tradition, Aristotelian uh, commentary and study and so forth. Um, but yes, Kithoni loved the Aristotle in 
um, Aquinas loved his sense of um, the universality of the patristic tradition, Latin fathers and Greek fathers, but particularly I think the clarity, he liked the method. Again, I don't think this is something foreign uh, to the Byzantines. Indeed, I think it's very possible to trace the whole scholastic method uh, to the Greek East uh, rather than the Latin West. But of course it reached a new height of sophistication at the time of people like um, Aquinas, and Bonaventure, Scotus and so forth. But um, it wasn't uh, yeah, intrinsically foreign uh, to the Greek way of doing, uh, doing theology. If you look at the Christological debates or much of what Maximus has to write, for example, or John Damascus, there's a willingness to to you know, use authorities in a particular way, to structure arguments in a particular way. So yes, Chidonis loved the, the philosophy, the patristics, and the, and the method, the clarity of the style, the clarity of the method, and um, thought it was a tremendously important thing to get this better known in the Greek East. And uh, you know, he talks about how the, the Romans at the time in Constantinople looked down upon the Latins as only good for kind of menial tasks, like innkeeping or being merchants or mercenaries. Um, they didn't have any respect for the intellectual culture of the Latin West. So he really took it upon himself as something of a, of a mission to get this stuff known in the Greek world and um, got the support of the emperor at the time, uh, John VI, Count of Cusine, uh, to make many copies um, of his translations. And he started with the Summa Contra Gentiles. So that's finished in uh, 1354. And he he did good chunks of the Summer Theologiae as well later, but the Summer Contra Gentiles was the big one, 1354. That's when Aquinas really entered into the Roman Empire in the East. Did he have to write a caveat or a preface saying, hey, I don't entirely agree with everything he says here? Well, Chithonis, Chithonis agreed with everything and actually ended up converting to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Um, um, but um, he does write various letters talking about, you know, why this stuff is important, uh, what he admires in it. Um, and Chithoni did come out as an anti-Palamite, as an anti-Palamite. Mm -hmm. And um, but doesn't actually write very much uh, against uh, Palamites, interesting enough. Um, no kind of very major works. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, he isn't. He is somebody who's so bowled over by Thomas that he actually ends up converting to Catholicism. But that's not the usual pattern, I would mm -hmm. say, or not the only pattern. Um, Palamites and anti-Palamites alike um, uh, followed Aquinas. Um, hmm. Now, what about someone like Nicholas Cabasilas? I, I remember reading his uh, commentary on the. The divine liturgy uh a while back but I, I think that you go over his perspective as well in in the book on aquinas is that right yes cavasilas comes into the story he's a he's an extraordinary figure a lay theologian um mm -hmm. writes extensively on the, the sacraments in particular and while palamas and many of his um, immediate forebears and disciples would focus on uh prayer particularly the jesus prayer as the path to the experience of the vision of God as light, the experience of God's self-gift, qua energy, qua operation, actualization, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, Kavasilas emphasizes more the sacraments as our path to theosis, to divinization, uh, deification. Uh, Kavasilas was certainly a supporter of Palamas and does put that in writing. But it's not something which permeates his works. He's not preoccupied by the essence energy distinction or even uh, the Jesus prayer or the character of the light of the transfiguration. And his, the path to theosis he sets before his readers is very much through participation in the life-giving and deifying um, sacraments of the church. And Cavasilas um, certainly had um, some knowledge of contemporary Latin theology, I think including um, Aquinas, but where you see the most obvious connections are actually with Anselm. So there's a very uh, definite engagement with Anselm's understanding of the atonement um, in Nicholas Cavasilas' uh, Life in Christ, um, where he sets um, um, Anselm's understanding of what happened um, on the cross within a broader arc of um, uh, a broader conception of salvation, um, going from the incarnation to deification not only uh, focusing on the 
sacrifice um, of the cross, but making very uh, positive, constructive, irenic uh, use of contemporary or near contemporary uh, Latin theology. But Cavasilas, yes, is a figure, a um, very attractive figure uh, in many ways. Now, one of the uh, most curious uh, figures, of course, would be Mark of Ephesus, and uh, very, very well known for his opposition there at the Council of Florence. I'm curious, how did he uh, digest Aquinas? What, what exactly was his perspective? And yeah, he makes uh, both positive and negative use of Aquinas. Um, he certainly doesn't see Aquinas as representative of a, a tradition that's wholly wrong. Um, certainly Aquinas is wrong on big issues like the filioque and the papal claims, uh, purgatory and, and so forth. But he will quote Aquinas with approval on some matters. For example, his understanding of the human person, um, mm. kind of hylomorphic you know, form, uh, body, soul, um, understanding, um, going back to Aristotle. Um, but he doesn't go as deep as Gennadius Scalarius. So Gennadius Scalarius is the one who takes over um, the leadership of the anti-unionist party uh, from uh, St. Mark of Ephesus. And um, as I mentioned earlier, becomes Patriarch of Constantinople after the fall of the city uh, to the Turks in 1453. Um, and he's an ardent um, anti-unionist by this time, although he supported the union at the time of the Reunion Council for Florence in 1438 to nine. But yes, he regards himself as the most devoted Thomist in the world, bar none. I don't think there's any any disciple of Thomas more ardent than I, he says, um, but he's leading the anti-union party. So this is the key difference, I think, between what's going on in the Byzantine or later Roman period and what's going on in some, especially 19th, 20th century um, orthodox apologetics, let's say, is that the, the Byzantines or late Romans were very happy to criticize Latin theology where it got things wrong okay, papal claims, etc. But certainly didn't see the West as inherently problematic, and nor did they set themselves up as kind of uh, mystical and liturgical, um, as opposed to the rationalistic and legalistic um, uh, West. You don't have this kind of global confrontation. And I think that's a very useful paradigm for Orthodox theology today, not to simply dismiss the whole Western tradition because it is Western, because it's too rationalistic, it's too legalistic and so forth but really engage with it and read it constructively, even with a hermeneutic of orthodoxy, but being very careful to, um, um, well, reject it where it goes contrary to the orthodox tradition, but not kind of globally, but on particular points. So um, when Aquinas maybe uses syllogisms for theological arguments, yeah. um, Mark of Ephesus and Gennadius Scolarius weren't necessarily opposed to that, is that correct? No, I mean, Mac uh, Mark of Ephesus writes a whole series of syllogisms against the Latins. Um, on the procession of the spirit mm. so it's a, it's a perfectly scholastic uh work arguing for the orthodox tradition i think gregory palamas equally says we must not dismiss the latins for using syllogisms for the fathers used syllogisms mm. as they say this whole idea of a rationalistic west versus a mystical east is is wrong uh, the mystical east yes certainly um, um there's a pronounced um emphasis on mystical experience in the christian east which i don't think is is there in the Christian West, but you also have the whole rational and scholastic tradition. You can see that in Palamas, you can see that in, in Mark of Ephesus uh, and others. Um, it's very easy to simplify the divide between East and West, but it's not as simple as it's sometimes presented. And on the flip side, would they see Aquinas as also, pre also presenting a mystical theology as well? Um, I mean, when you, well, I'm not sure who exactly you're 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 you're, you're, you're talking about, well, but in, Scolarius, for example. Yeah, no, that wouldn't be something that Scolarius would particularly emphasize in uh, Aquinas. But but why would he? I mean, there's no sense at the time that we are doing things completely differently to the Latin West. Mm -hmm. But I think when we today look at Aquinas, we can appreciate a mystical dimension, a liturgical dimension, a sacramental dimension, patristic dimension. Uh, to his work, which is certainly not as pronounced as uh, um, yeah, most figures in the in the Orthodox East, but is there nonetheless. And let's not forget that he had, uh, you know, a mystical vision um, towards the end of his life, sixth of December, uh, twelve seventy three, um, vision that his whole 
work was as straw and he didn't write another word afterwards or didn't write very much afterwards uh, at any rate I think he wrote a, a little thing or two um, that's not I think a vision of his work as being worthless but just a, a recognition that any human uh, work of theology is going to be a straw when compared to the divine mystery so there's a there's a mystical dimension um, in Thomas uh, too but it's not something that Byzantine or late Roman Palamites picked up on because there was no sense then of well, we're mystical and you're rational. I mean, that simply wasn't a, a thing. So after Scholarius, when we start getting into more of the modern period, tell us a little bit about the Greek and Russian responses to Aquinas, and then um, did it did it differ with the previous period? Well, actually, uh, I would say there's a basic continuity down to the early 19th century. So we've got numerous figures working in the Ottoman era in Greek-speaking lands who make very positive, constructive, extensive uh, use of Aquinas. Uh, George Coresios, uh, Vincent Zamados. I mean, these are not names that are terribly well known, but are important theologians of the, the Ottoman era who produce excellent um, orthodox theology in constructive dialogue with um, Latin theology um, in the Russian world. Um, you see a similar um, ability to engage constructively with Aquinas. I mean, sometimes we're getting a bit too far in terms of becoming a bit of a slavish imitation, but uh, certainly figures who will be uh, appropriately critical uh, to Aquinas, but make positive uh, use of him. But what changes is, is, is in the 19th century and the emergence of the Slavophiles. I mean, this is where I think this simple dichotomy between rational uh, West and uh, mystical East uh, really begins to um, what well, first appears uh, in the Orthodox world. It takes a long time to be established as um, you know, a common way of conceiving uh, the differences between East and West. But you know, the Russian Slavophiles, people like Ivan Kirievsky, Alexei Komyakov, um, reacting against the policy of Westernization introduced by Peter the Great and his successors, tend to very much emphasize the indigenous traditions of Russia, um, Slav culture, and especially Orthodox theology, Orthodox liturgy and so forth, and set that up as a kind of paradigm of opposition vis-a-vis -vis the rationalistic, scholastic West. So these simple dichotomies go back to the Slavophiles in the 19th century. And although for much of the 19th century, the Slavophiles remained, I think, a somewhat marginal voice uh, within Orthodox theology, in the 20th century, um, particularly the diaspora following on from the Russian Revolution, um, broadly speaking, their dichotomous uh, vision of East and West became, well, widespread um, in the Orthodox world. Um, I suppose it's very clear in somebody like um, Vladimir Lossky, also Sergius Bulgakov. Um, amongst 20th century Orthodox theologians, I think it's Father George Ferovsky who's most balanced, in fact, in his understanding of East-West difference. And actually the most... Um, willing to engage with high scholasticism, for example, um, far more so than neither Lossky or Bukakov. So how did figures like Lossky account for Byzantine scholasticism? Well, they didn't, uh, for the most part. I mean, this is mm. what's been, I think, quite eye-opening about the kind of material I've been um, dealing with, that, uh, that there is this Byzantine or late Roman scholastic tradition that Aquinas was actually rather popular amongst the, the late Romans, the Byzantines. Um, yeah, that really doesn't uh, feature. Um, Lossky, for example, thought that um, Akinthinos, who was Balaam's successor as the leader of the anti-Palamite party, um, had written some works which were very Thomist. And in fact, it's since been shown that these works were by Prochorus Chizones, uh, not by um, Gregory Akinthinos. And equally, he seems to take Valam as representative of the West, which he wasn't in any way, shape or form. Why, why do you think it, it is that maybe they, they didn't really account? Did they just not have access to these sources or what, what do you think it was? Well, yeah, I mean, the sources have been um, a bit of a mess and still a lot of it's being um, edited. And, um, uh, yeah. A lot of it's still ought to be edited, let alone um, translated. So yeah, a bit of a problem in terms of sources, access to sources. 
um, but perhaps also a bit of an inherited mindset going back to the Slavophiles of, well, you know, obviously Palamas and his successors would have been implacably opposed to Aquinas as soon as they caught a sniff of him. But, um, and if you have that kind of mindset, you don't necessarily dig deeply to see if it's uh, there or not. So, um, but I think it, you know, I, I don't want to dismiss any of this work in any way, shape or form. I mean, I'm a huge admirer of people like Vlasky and uh, Bogarkov, and especially, I think, uh, Thororsky. But um, it's worth remembering that they were working in the diaspora context at a time when orthodoxy was very little known um, in the you know, largely Protestant or Catholic inspired uh, world of academic theology or ecumenical theology. And, you know, in some ways, I think to get orthodoxy even kind of noticed, they, they needed almost to accentuate um, the differences between orthodoxy and uh, Catholic or Protestant theology. And perhaps that went a bit far at some points. And it's very much to do with this inherited Slavophile legacy, I think, of East-West um, dichotomy. Um, but I don't think, you know, anything I, I've been doing in terms of nuancing mm -hmm. would have been possible without them having um, done such amazing work in, uh, in, in expressing and articulating Orthodox theology in um, a Western theological context. So tell me about a Byzantine Thomas um, Thomas perspective that you discuss in your book. What exactly is a Byzantine Thomas? And, and well, its perspective? Yeah. You know, you've got to be a bit careful, I think, about talking about Byzantine Thomas. I mean, were there any figures in the last couple of hundred years of the, the Roman Empire in the East mm -hmm. that were Thomists as such, insofar as they took Thomas, Thomas as their kind of preeminent uh, guide and source of authority uh, akin to, um, let's say, the Church Fathers. I mean, I'm not sure I'd, I'd want to give that label to anyone in, mm. in the last centuries, even Canadius Scalarius. So he's a devoted disciple of Thomas. He hugely admires Thomas, but he clearly distinguishes himself from um, Thomas on key questions like the essence energies distinction and the papal claims. Indeed, he laments that Thomas had been born um, by the Tiber, you know, raised by the Tiber rather than by the Bosphorus, because of course if he'd been born in the ongoing Roman Empire in the East, he would have had no need to defend indefensible things like the Filioque or failing to recognize the essence energies uh, distinction. So uh, yeah, I wouldn't talk about Byzantine Thomism tomis, or Byzantine Thomists as such. There's always this a critical dimension uh, to the reception of Thomas that I think is incompatible with the label Thomist. Now, kind of following up on that, is there an orthodox appropriation of Aquinas? That's another thing you kind of deal with in the end of the Oh, book. yeah. So I, while I wouldn't want to talk about orthodox Thomists as such, I think the Byzantine late Roman reception uh, of Aquinas, and indeed the reception of Aquinas in early modern orthodox theology, gives us um, yeah, a pattern, a paradigm for appropriating uh, Thomas uh, today. And that's maybe taking a slightly different uh, approach to Thomas than you find amongst many contemporary Thomists. So certainly not viewing him as the kind of authority he is, say, within uh, Dominican um, mm. theology, but um, recognizing there's a, a common inheritance there, uh, patristic, um, conciliar, scholastic. Um, he's a extraordinary theologian who while he may have got some things wrong from an orthodox point of view, nonetheless has a lot to offer and I think um, needs to be engaged with uh, positively and constructively and might even end up um, you know, producing a slightly different picture of Thomas than we do get in, say, contemporary Thomist um, theology. Um, because, of course, the, the kind of approach I'm talking about is an approach which really emphasizes his Greek patristic sources, his Greekness more generally, even, as this use of Aristotle. Um, and that's not necessarily the way that, um, you know, all, say, 19th, 20th century Thomism has gone. If there is a more of a larger appropriation of Aquinas and orthodoxy, how do you think that will impact orthodoxy in a healthy yeah, way? Well, I, I way? don't see it as making any fundamental changes. Yeah. I, I think, it, you know, to be honest, it's it's more the the fruits of the dialogue that are important. Mm. You know, getting away from this, we reject the West, we reject mm -hmm. Augustine, Anselm, Aquinas. It's quite 
always easy to, to remember that all the bad guys in the West begin with A. You probably add Abelard as well. But uh, anyway, we reject all of those guys beginning with A. And we're pure, we're mystical, we're liturgical and so forth, non-rationalistic, non-scholastic. So actually reading Aquinas and engaging with Aquinas and see where he's wrong in terms of orthodox theology, but also where he's consonant with orthodox theology, you know, it's probably the key lesson, you know, I want to get out of this, to move away mm. from this um, opposition and move yeah. towards more of a kind of paradigm of dialogue and exchange, which, which by extension can apply to other figures in uh, Latin theology and indeed in uh, later Protestant theology. And I think it's a kind of confidence issue in a way. There's a kind of lack of confidence, it seems to me, in simply rejecting the West as um, rationalistic and so forth. You know, orthodoxy has got to be able to stand up and really dialogue and engage with these figures without just retreating into a kind of um, paradigm of opposition. So how is your work, on, especially this, this particular book, how has it been received so far by Catholics and Orthodox? Yes, well, oh gosh, yes, yes. Well, it's it's had its fun effect, I think. Um, I've had um, positive um, reviews and so forth from both Catholic and Orthodox um, writers. I mean, clearly, it's um, it um, it upsets any easy narrative of opposition between East and West, which has been quite a comforting part of Orthodox self identity um, much of the nineteenth and especially the twentieth century. But, you know, thankfully, uh, so far, I haven't had anything too awful in terms of, oh, this is just uh, Western propaganda or anything like that from an orthodox side. Um, so actually, it's been more positive than I might have expected, given that it, it, it does kind of change the paradigm in terms of you know, not viewing uh, the West as uh, entirely wrong. But um, then again, um, there may well be there may well be people who don't like it very much, but I haven't heard much from them. So that carries on. <laughs> right. So, so there's a few chat questions here. Uh, one from Patrick. Did the Greeks have a view on the essence and energies before Palamas and Aquinas? I know we briefly touched on that, but maybe if you want to expand. Yeah. On. Well, it, it's worth noting that this essence energy distinction, uh, as presented by Palamas, is nothing new. Um, he doesn't say, look, here's an amazing way of looking at this issue. Let's distinguish uh, God as usia or essence from God as he gives himself to the world and his energies. I mean, the language goes way back uh, and the, the idea goes way back to the Cappadocians, to Dionysius, to Maximus, to John Damascus. And um, I think the Cappadocians are the kind of key turning point here. So the Cappadocians in emphasizing the unknowability of God in the context of the ongoing Arian controversy um, especially in relating to Eunomius, who apparently claimed to know God better than he knew himself, but that's uh, another question. But anyhow, in the context of the ongoing Arian controversy, the Cappadocians, and you know, emphasizing Basil, Basil the Great, and uh, Gregory of Nyssa, distinguish between the essence of God and that which pertains to the essence or that which is around the essence, things like wisdom, goodness, power, and so forth. So we never know the Osea, but we do know God's self revelation in his goodness, wisdom, power, and so forth. Dionysius has a similar framework with his understanding of God's beneficent processions. I think we see something similar in Maximus's understanding of the Logoi. So basically this idea of a distinction between God as he is and his unknowable essence, which we cannot name or define, and God as he gives himself, makes himself known, uh, shows himself as light. Um, whether you want to call that energies or things that pertain to the essence or Logoi or uh, processions, the, the basic distinction goes way back. Of course, it's clarified in Palamas, but there's nothing new in Palamas. And of course, this is very different to what we find in Aquinas. I mean, Aquinas has what's often called an identity thesis of divine simplicity. In other words, God is identical with his attributes. So God is identical with his wisdom, goodness, power, and so forth. And that's formally incompatible with the way in which Cappadocians, Maximus, Dionysius, Palamas speak about the distinction between God and his, um, God and his attributes. But still within, a, of course, um, a very... Um, uh, still maintaining a very strong emphasis on divine simplicity. I mean, divine simplicity is as non-negotiable for Palamas as it is for Aquinas. Well, you know, before I get to the next question, let me ask, why, why do you think it is that Aquinas relies on Eastern figures like Dionysius and yet doesn't embrace his perspective on the essence and energies distinction, assuming that Dionysius 
properly represents that perspective. Yes. Well, I, I think you probably have to remember that, the, you know, in terms of patristic sources, Augustine remains the single most important figure for the mm. final. And so what Augustine has to say about, say, the identity of God with his attributes, or the possibility of the vision of God um, in his very being, the beatific vision, um, this is a more dominant strand in Aquinas than anything he might pick up from Dionysius. The Dionysius, I think, has to be you know, modified in Aquinas or downplayed or taken in a certain way because Augustine is the, the, the benchmark. When it comes to divine simplicity, when it comes to the question of the vision of the very being of God, um, Augustine comes first and Dionysius um, second. And this is why I mentioned earlier that I don't think Aquinas uh, takes up the radical apophaticism of Dionysus, because you don't have this sense of the all-seer being utterly unknowable and unseeable, even in the beatific vision. Uh, there's another question here. What does Dr. Uh, Plested's, or what is Dr. Uh, Plested, Plested's opinion on Aquinas's doctrine of simplicity as an orthodox theologian? Is it theologically sound and philosophically sound? We, we, kind of touched on that a little bit but maybe wow. yeah, it's, well, yeah. You know, <laughs> past judgment on the you know, yeah religions like Aquinas but from yeah. the point of view it's problematic mm -hmm. um and it certainly doesn't fit with this long tradition going back to the Cappadocians of distinguishing between God and his attributes and I think in, in Aquinas you've got the additional um problem that the, the attributes are not only identical with the the essence of God but they're also identical with each other and again, even within the West, I'm thinking here particularly of Duns Scotus, you know, sort of grave problems. You know, how is God's wisdom right. identical with his goodness, with his power, and so forth? But I would certainly say, without myself personally passing mm -hmm. judgment on Aquinas, his construction sure. of divine simplicity is highly problematic from an Orthodox point of view. And, and is debated even among Catholics, as you, yeah, as you exactly. noted there with Scotus. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay. And um, did the Cappadocians really teach the essence and energies distinction in your estimation? Yeah, no, yes, well, well, yes and no. I think when the Cappadocians, actually, I say, keep, keep saying the Cappadocians, but here we're really talking, especially, I think, about Basil and Gregory of Nyssa. Mm -hmm. I think it was a different understanding of divine simplicity in Gregory Nazianzus, Gregory the theologian. But in Basil and his younger brother, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, we do certainly have something like the essence energies distinction but not necessarily in terms of the vocabulary used so sometimes the um the the, the two cappadocians i'm talking about basil and gregory of nyssa will distinguish between the usia and the energies when they're doing that sometimes they're talking about the created effects uh, the energimata um so there's not necessarily an exact equivalence in language sometimes when they're talking about essence energies it's essence and uncreated energies wisdom, mm -hmm. power, goodness, and so forth. Sometimes it's created energy. So we know God from his, his work, from, from the creation, for example. So they don't necessarily teach it with exactly the same vocabulary at all times. Sometimes, yes. They more often they're talking about the distinction between the usia, unknowable, and the uh, knowable or partially knowable attributes or the things around the essence, peritus usias, around the essence. So they really taught it, yes, but not necessarily in exactly that kind of language, kind of vocabulary. But it's certainly there, the, the base distinction. Now, Gregory the Great, you said, is a little different in his not understanding. Gregory the Great, Gregory the Theologian. I'm sorry, not Gregory the Great. What did I say? Yeah. Uh, right, Gregory the Theologian. You said that his perspective was a, a little different. Well, yes, I'm not. Um, I don't see that kind of distinction between the essence and the attributes that we find in Gregory mm. Nyssa or Basil. He's not so clearly. Mm. Yeah. Um, so another question here, kind of related: Why doesn't Palamas call energies attributes or properties? How and why yeah. did the word energy become so popular? Yeah, I mean, because it's not the only work he'll he'll use. I mean, he talks mm -hmm. about xenomies quite often, powers, um, and equally, you know, he doesn't talk about energies. Of course, he talks about energy. I mean, the Greek term. And you know, we translate it as energy, but I, I often think, and many other uh, people think this too, that it's a slightly problematic rendition in that in English, we have an idea of energy. You know, it's like um, you know, having energy to go for a jog in the morning or energy coming from a battery or solar panel or something. It's not necessarily a word that really sums up everything 
that Habermas is trying to convey. So energies, as Palamas uses it, does incorporate what we would understand by e.g. attributes or processions or powers or properties or what have you. So there's a problem here in how we translate the term energy. But I think in Palamas, it's much broader uh, than anything we tend to associate with the word energy uh, in contemporary English. Last question here. Is the Trinitarian theology of the Cappadocians in Constantinople I reconcilable with later Western, mostly Augustinian tr uh, Trinitarian theology, in your estimation? Uh, Cappadocians in Constantinople I. Um, yes. I mean, the big question would be, to what extent does Augustine uh, teach, um, say, well, the filioque, that uh, mm. is it... Um, sort of irrefutable is it a suggestion in Augustine and it's certainly more than a suggestion in Augustine but I think there's no way in which Augustine would um, you know, want to introduce an extra uh, word um, into the creed to support this approach um, you know we don't need I, I would say we don't need to add the term and the son of the creed nor do we need to add the term only proceeds only from the father um, to the creed both would be both would be wrong so I would say, yeah, certainly compatible. And don't forget that Augustine also talks about the, even when he's talking about the filioque, he talks about the spirit proceeding principalita according to principle uh, from the father, which is exactly what the Cappadocians are trying to express uh, through the, their understanding of the monarchy of the father. The father is the sole source, ye fount um, of divinity. So I would say, I would say yes. And of course, Augustine um, certainly didn't distinguish himself from the theology of Constantinople I, or the theology of the Cappadocians, insofar as he knew it. Mm. Um, so I would say there is a compatibility there, so long as you don't add the word filioque to the creed. <laughs> so I think it's more, more problematic. So are there uh, any other works that you're currently uh, working on right now um, that we can look forward to? Yes, well, I've just finished a book, which should be out in April, on um, wisdom. So wisdom in the Church Fathers, mm. um, in dialogue with modern Russian sophiology. So the idea of wisdom in people like Sergius Bulgakov, is that compatible with the Church Fathers or not? And I also, as well as talking about the Greek patristic tradition, also talk about the Latin patristic tradition, even up to the medieval scholastics like Aquinas, who of course were very much uh, bad guys for modern uh, Russian uh, sophiology. So there's a book about wisdom, it should be out in April. April, okay. April, apparently, that's what I'm told at the moment. But, uh, it's in press okay. anyway. Excellent. Is there anything else uh, that you want to put in a plug in? Oh, uh, yes. Well, another book I hope is going to be out um, in March of 2023 is a little book on the Greek theologian uh, Demetrius Koutroubis, who's very little known in either East or West, but a very important bridge figure between uh, East and West. He's a Greek Orthodox who grew up Orthodox, became a Jesuit, returned to the Orthodox Church, became a great inspiration for the whole called Generation of the 60s in modern Greece, people like Christos Yanaras and Paniotis Nelas and others. Um, so I'm producing an edited volume on uh, Kutrubis. Excellent. Looking forward to it, Dr. Plested. It was an honor having you on. You answered uh, so many questions and, and helped clarify a lot of issues uh, mm. for me personally and, and I'm sure for everybody else watching as well. So thank you so much for doing this. Oh, wonderful. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Same here. You're always welcome on the show. Everybody, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Also, check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. Thank you all for watching. God bless. Till next time. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you can't